Today's guest is Cassin Crooker with THX, and we get to talk about the world of spatial audio. You know, more and more these days, our handheld devices that live in our pockets come with accessories that provide what we know as spatial audio. And yet, there are few far and in-between opportunities to truly experience the marvel of this newer technology. Sure, there are places where you can go and they have the full set of speakers that help you listen to that experience. And you might play well-known songs like Bohemian Rhapsody or something by the Beatles like Eleanor Rigby. And you hear the musical experiences, how it goes all the way to the left, all the way to the right. It's not exactly what we're talking about here in this conversation. It's far deeper than that. And part of the treat of listening to this episode is we'll get to talk to someone who's been in the business for a very long time. Not only from the music production aspect and being part of bands themselves, but also stepping into the immersive technology that we use today, starting even with familiar games like Rock Band and what that's like with Guitar Hero and things of that nature. And being able to, as uh, Kasson put it, it's like karaoke for those who don't want to sing. So when you think of the types of experiences that his career has had him develop and create for all of us and the entertainment world and to be able to make our lives richer, better, far more immersive. Here we have now a technology and a plugin developed by THX that allows creators to do that, create experience for others. And when we talk about AR and VR coming into the picture more and more in conjunction with spatial audio, it only makes sense to learn as much as you can about that. So you understand the types of experiences that are going to be available to all of us, either as a consumer or as a creator. And there's even a special offer just for those who are listening to this podcast. If you are a creator and want to get your hands down and dirty on using this product as soon as possible to take your creations to the next level. So with that said, again, you get to listen to someone with years of experience from the beginning of the music industry where it was very analog all the way to digital, all the way to today where it's virtual. So without further ado, we're talking to Cassin Crooker of THX. Cassin, I am so happy to have you here. I, I think I mentioned before we hit record that I'm a big fan of THX just as a brand. And I don't know many people who aren't, uh, you know, let's look at Star Wars, for example, as, a, as its impact and, and what have you. But I, I want to start off by getting to there instead of just starting there immediately, right? And when I was doing some research on the work you've done in the past prior to THX and things of that nature, I learned that you were in music yourself. You had bands like Freeze Pop and Splashdown, and then you got into the video game development uh, area and how that influenced your music production. So can we start there with a little bit of background and your musical background? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, first off, thanks for having me, Philip. Great to be on the podcast and chat about music and creativity and tools and really excited to dive in. And, you know, sort of to answer your question, uh, a lot of it started with getting exposed to synthesizers and drum machines. I grew up in the 80s. So I was enamored with a lot of 80s synth bands, Depeche Mode and New Order and that whole sort of the dark side of synth pop music from the 80s. And that really got me inspired to get into music. And honestly, it's been a wild journey um, since then. It's been 30 years. Um, and I've gotten to go into some really interesting areas around music, audio technology, uh, building tools for other creators to you know, get inspired by, or creating video games where even gamers get creatively inspired. So it's been a really interesting journey where I've gotten to be involved in numerous areas of music but always music has been at the foundation and the core of the projects that I've worked on over the years. And what was it like getting into the video game development side of things? How did that transition happen for you? I actually sort of fell into it. I, I went to college to do music production. I was really interested in synthesis, audio recording. This was back in the early 90s, which was a really interesting time because the whole world in music and audio was switching from analog over to digital. Computers could actually record music. Synthesizers and samplers had just been invented. And so it was a really inspirational time from watching the, those tools evolve. Um, and But with video games, I never intended to get into that. I sort of fell into it. There was a local company. I was in Boston, and they were making uh, auto racing games. And uh, they needed somebody who could be their sound person. They were just using, I think, stock samples or something. 
And so I sort of fell into that job. I had never made a video game before, but that really got me immersed in the, you know, the world of what that technology needs and how to approach sound design uh, and composition. And uh, it wasn't the right fit for me from a, uh, from a point of view that I'm not into auto racing. So fortunately, with my next video game gig, I fell in with the amazing crew at a company called Harmonix. Um, and they were beginning their very first music game. Uh, this was back in 2000 called Frequency. And uh, those early games there were the foundation for later very popular music games like Guitar Hero uh, and Rock Band. And so I had fallen in with that crew there because I wrote numerous genres of electronic music. They needed somebody who could write house, techno, drum and bass, synth pop, all these sort of different subgenres of electronic music uh, because their game didn't have a huge budget. They couldn't afford lots of like big name bands. And so I was just writing all this music for video games. And uh, I mean, it was amazing. It was a perfect fit. I was already just writing that kind of music anyways. So now I got paid to do it. And then other people got to play these games with my music in it. And I, it was just, yeah, it was a really wonderful time. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's lost on many people in business because they're busy with SaaS products, in particular for project management or time uh, time tracking and things of that nature, that they don't realize just how massive an industry video games are. And even just the music department of it, right, where many have lost the record business, if you will. Uh, a colleague of mine just got their song synced to Street Fighter VI and what yeah, that's doing nice. for his career, right? And so when I think about just like the the level of impact that that has on so many people's daily lives with video games becoming part of everyday life and soon to be even more integrated with VR and AR, I think it's really, really an exciting time for the work that you're doing, right? And I'm, and I'm curious, when you were coming into the game, and making these songs for, and I think you said rock band, like the game yeah. with the with the instruments that yeah yeah Guitar Hero and rock yeah, band yeah, and, yeah 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 okay so when when you go into that workflow is it done in silos because I'm I don't know, I'm thinking like team culture and how technology works I know there's a lot of development that goes in is it done in silos or are you able to interface with the many departments to get buy in from them or is that even necessary yeah oh totally necessary I mean team. Any company that has silos, I get a little wary of because they're controlling the flow of communication between teams. That lack of awareness means that you can make mistakes in the software you're developing or the game that you're making. And so fortunately, Harmonix was very democratic in their design. They were constantly, I mean, there were game designers, right, who were tasked with inventing the game. Um, but we were all musicians and we were making a music game. So there was a lot of um, passing of information and collaborating on ideas, even about sort of little things like how the peripheral looked and felt to how fast the music could flow at you and you could react to it. And so there was a lot of communication and back and forth. We were a small team, so we, we were really operating as a startup. Um, and somebody would come up with an idea and we'd be like, that's amazing. And so we would rapidly prototype that idea and try to get it in and you know be as agile as possible in creating those early games. It was more difficult later on, you know, when the company was 50 people, it was a very different experience than, you know, when your game company is, you know, three, four, 500 people or even larger, um, then the flow of communication is even more challenging. But those early days, especially in Guitar Hero, um, were great. It was easy to communicate and throw ideas out and try stuff out quickly and, and see what sticks. Now, just before we get into it, because now I'm curious about how this all connects to you with uh, collaborating and working, you know, with THX and mm -hmm. being being able to be a part of that experience. I'm curious, what was that transition like for you to be part of the early team and watch that, because that's very relevant for people listening, to watch that develop into this massive team and, and how that changed workflows? Oh, it was, uh, it was a wild ride. <laughs> um, and it happened very fast. We were, you know, we were a small company making games that would just sell, you know, three to 500,000 copies when we made Guitar Hero 1, we just thought it was going to be another another one of those, right? A little teeny game, doesn't really reach a lot of people, but the audience who finds it loves it. But then what we found out was that game was being played at parties, lots of parties, right? It was the new karaoke, right? It yep. was karaoke for people who didn't like to sing, uh, right? I, I feel that. more comfortable playing a guitar part than like holding this mic and singing. And so it just exploded. And then with that, the company exploded. And so it was it was a lot of adjustment. 
But I think one of the smart moves that the company made at that point was to really grow the talent from within the company. So I, you know, I started as an entry level audio person, then I became the audio director, then I became a game director. And so within three years, I went from sort of writing music for a small game to running a six person audio team to managing a hundred person game development team. Wow. And I never went to, right? I didn't go to school for any of that. I mean, there was no school for that. You just sort of had ambition uh, and sort of immersed yourself and threw yourself at the job. And, and you know, that, that took its toll on the other parts of my life. Um, <laughs> I didn't really have a good boundaries between personal life and uh, work life back then. But it was, yeah, it was really exciting. And, you know, some things went well and some things didn't go so well. And you get so large, you know, it, uh, budgets, you know, get bigger and your schedule starts slipping and all of those things. But still, the creativity was the core of the experience. And you brought something interesting up. You started off in such a creative capacity and slowly moved more technical to eventually managerial yeah. and working directly with developers. What can you say you've learned from that? Being predominantly creative, obviously capable in so many other ways, but being predominantly at your core creative and working with people who are technical and and, and engineering backgrounds and, and writing code. What was that like? And how did you create a successful uh, 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 synthesis between yourselves as a team? Sure. Well, hiring is a huge part of that. So, you know, a, a, A's hire A's and B's hire C's. So you got to hire A's. And so, and especially finding, you know, and people talk about team culture and hiring. And I mean, when you're making a creative experience, you have to hire technical people who have some, you know, creative spark in them. You know, I didn't need somebody who was out there making, when I was making music games, right? I didn't need to hire somebody who was also touring, but I did hire somebody who was like, I have a guitar. I love playing guitar. It's like what I do in my spare time. And so, you know, hone in on finding technical people who have that some some creativity you know at their core is huge but the other thing is that you know I love working with pure technical people even even at THX I get to work with a lot of uh, DSP engineers right and so they're inventing new spatial audio technology or new audio processing wizardry and I'm on the other side of the fence I, I sort of know what they're talking about because I have sort of that technical background but you know they sort of go off onto these incredible tangents. But what I'm bringing there is I'm bringing the end user experience or I'm bringing the, the listener experience to that and reminding them that, you know, while their technology is really great on paper, right? Is it, is it what the world needs? Is it what the audience wants to listen to? And so I find that there's actually a really good back and forth between creatives and technical people to meet in the middle and make sure that they're actually making something that people want. And, and in our case, we need to make sure it sounds good, the technology applies to the experience, and that we're just not, you know, inventing technology for technology's sake. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up THX as a perfect way to transition into it. So how did so how do you go from there? And I don't know if there was just a partner at the time with uh, with harmonics and what you were doing there. How, how did you get over to THX? Yeah, it was a, it was a little bit of a circuitous route. I actually basically just changed careers. Um, I left Harmonix, I left making video games, and I moved to Microsoft and started working on HoloLens. So that was their spatial wow. computer. This was HoloLens V1. Yeah. So this was, this was about 10 years ago. Um, and they needed somebody to help bring in spatial audio technology and build all these really interesting spatial audio experiences to show off to people inside the company and outside of the company what you could do with audio. Um, and I had already sort of gotten into it. I was getting really into mixing music and surround at that point. I got bored by stereo and moved into multi-channel music and I started performing in surround. So I would be in the middle and then the speakers would be all around me and the audience would be inside the speakers. And so I was already getting sort of really enamored by what I call immersive listening experiences. And so at Microsoft, that was really when I got exposed to, you know, very um, technical spatial audio uh, technology, HRTFs, and all of the, you know, the wizardry that makes up, you know, delivering a spatial audio experience, and then how to match that with a device that can show you immersive visuals. And, you know, now it's taking off once again with Apple Vision Pro and, you know, say, and MetaQuest yeah. 3 and so all this VR stuff. So I really got pulled into that world and fortunately found a good uh, home to learn about spatial audio at Microsoft um, and worked there for a little bit on HoloLens. And then I started doing freelance audio production. And uh, 
Fortunately, and maybe this is something we talk about as well, right? Like in the industry, it's all about making your connections and staying close with people and friends. And um, the CEO at THX, Jason Fiber, he and I have been colleagues. At one time, he managed my band. Um, he's run a record label. And wow. so he's had an interesting career. And so over the years, we've stayed in touch. We're friends. And then there was an opportunity at THX to join and become a product manager and really try to take their nascent spatial audio technology and start to build some tools for creators out of it. Oh, and and that whole journey could have been a podcast in itself, I'm sure. So thank you for (laughs) doing your best to condense all of that. Uh, Well, you know, you always ask people advice. You never know where your career is going to go. So, (laughs) you know, get some skills you know, get good at them. Like, you know, they have the, the sort of like the T-shaped employee, right? Yeah. You, you have a bunch of broad skills, but then you need to go deep. And so mine was spatial audio, but I can do all these other things and you never know what job you'll end up at. And so, yeah, it's been interesting to veer around inside the music industry. I mean, it just sounds like you've been at the cutting edge of so many points in the history of this tech in general with music and technology in mm-hmm. particular as the, as the, uh, crux there. And so I'm curious now, uh, I have the chance to sit here and listen to you speak and share with us what THX has been working on in the realm of spatial audio, if I'm not mistaken. And I'd love if you could just dive into that and sort of set the stage for us. Sure. Well, I mean, let me do a quick primer of spatial audio. People may hear it a lot. They probably hear immersive audio a lot. Um, you hear virtual surround, 360-degree audio. There's lots, lots of sort of marketing buzzwords for it. Um, I sort of view spatial audio as the technology and immersive audio as the experience. And so you're seeing a lot of that now, especially with AR and VR experiences, because what you're trying to do there is match a virtual world with the real world around you, and what you hear is a big part of that perception. And so spatial audio is basically trying to match how we hear the world, right? We use our ears, we use the world around us, sound waves are bouncing around and reflecting, and um, the personal aspect of our bodies, like the shape of our heads and how big our ears are and these pinna on the outside, um, that's how we hear the world. And so spatial audio technology is basically an algorithm that is trying to um, uh, simulate that listening experience through headphones. So that when you put on headphones and you close your eyes, or if you put on headphones and you put on, say, a VR device and you look at a virtual world, that you really believe what you're hearing and seeing. And that's where spatial audio makes a big component uh, from that. And so being able to hear the difference between stereo and spatial audio, I think, is a key to realizing what an interesting listening effect it is. Is it all right if we play a couple of samples for people listening here? And hopefully you have headphones on. If you don't, you can pause here and actually go and put on some headphones to listen to Yeah, put on some headphones. And yeah, spatial audio is, since we're trying to mimic the sound of the real world, it requires headphones. You can do some spatial audio on soundbars and speakers. It's a little bit more tricky and it sort of involves some different um, spatial audio technology, but headphones is where, where it really shines. So yeah, let's play a clip and let people hear the difference between stereo and spatial audio. Right. So now that we've been able to sort of interface with that, what that experience is supposed to be like, can you sort of dive into what THX has done with the spatial creator tool? Sure. Yeah. So about, I think about six or seven years ago, THX really uh, pushed into spatial audio as a new way to add uh, listening experience and level up listening experiences. I mean, that's been the core mission going all the way back to the George Lucas era. And so looking at spatial audio as an area where you can really level up and improve that experience became important to THX. And so when I joined a few years ago, the goal was to start to bring some of those tools to creators. 
Uh, we released some plugins for game developers. Games are a great place to add spatial audio. Um, and what I've been working on and just released this last fall is a tool for musicians, for people like me who work in DAWs and digital audio workstations, who are um, either composers, bedroom producers, mix engineers, um, sound designers for video games, podcast creators, um, to have a tool to add spatial audio to their mixes. Um, I think th as this is sort of an emerging industry with spatial audio, there's lots of competing different technologies. Many of them are very complicated and expensive to use. And so if you're sort of a bedroom producer who's like, well, I keep hearing about immersive audio, do I need all these speakers? <laughs> like, what do I need to do? Like, <laughs> I need all this software and speakers and a room, and it just seems very complicated. And when really, you just need a tool that lets you just add some spatial audio. You don't have to do it to your whole mix. You can just do it to like one sound. So that was our goal, is create a very intuitive, low-cost uh, tool for bedroom producers and sound designers and mix engineers to start to add spatial audio without having to sort of like fully invest their entire studio in that ecosystem. So that was sort of our mandate going into it. Um, and so we we took our spatial audio technology and we basically tuned it to work best for musicians. Um, and so that's a tool that you can bring into Ableton, Pro Tools, Digital Performer, um, whatever your DAW of choice is, and you can add it there. And then you can add it to just individual instruments or you can add it to your entire mix. Um, so you could have a fully binauralized mix. The other great thing about this tool is because you're just using it inside a digital audio workstation, you're still working in stereo, right? You're not working in surround anymore. You're sort of oh. adding surround effects to your mono or stereo tracks, is that when you're done, you've got a stereo file that is spatialized. It's got spatial audio in it. And so you can put that onto YouTube. You can put it onto SoundCloud and just send links to your fans. And as long as they put headphones on, they can hear your spatial audio, right? You don't need to, it doesn't have to go to streaming services. It can really go anywhere. Um, I've done spatial audio mixes and just put them up onto Bandcamp um, for my VIP subscribers. And it lets them hear my spatial audio mixes. And I don't, as long as they're wearing headphones, it doesn't matter. They just need a pair of headphones and they can play it back from their computer, from their phone. It really doesn't matter. It's, it's just uh, what I like about our approach is that it's very platform agnostic. And that's that's what's going to make it so great and catch on so quickly, I think. I hope is, so, yeah. Is because of that. Uh, ha, is there machine learning underlying the technology? You know, that seems to be the big thing now. It is the big thing. People, yeah, right? yeah. And, and we're certainly taking a hard look at where it can improve things. Um, again, my belief is that, you know, AI's impact on tools and, you know, uh, a lot of times tools get in the way of creative people like myself yeah. trying to do the thing that we want to do, right? It's like, oh, I have a learning curve on this tool or, or there's any number of boundaries. And, and I think AI has a huge opportunity to improve the tools we use. For <laughs> that said, for this spatial audio plugin, there's no underlying AI technology for it. It's really uh, based on a lot of academic research about um, perception and psychoacoustics wow. and how we hear the world so that when you use the tool and you add it to your tracks, it's really believable that there is a sound flying around your head. So it's really more um, the science of hearing and psychoacoustics. Um, but yeah, AI could definitely play a role in this in the future. I love that it's coming out now and that we're having this conversation because every day there are more and more companies like uh, like uh, Apple or, or uh, we're talking uh, mm -hmm. Samsung and other companies that are adopting the spatial audio technology and the accessories that they sell for their yep. devices. And so now more than ever, a tool like this could really enhance a creator's ability to create experiences that indulge their their dedicated listeners in ways that they probably couldn't do before. Yeah, so to hear exactly. you say you're still working in stereo, but you can create this experience for anyone who has those capabilities, which most probably do, given the the sale uh, and the adoption of these spatial audio tools, that just aren't there isn't enough being made use of them, if you will, right. is what I'm seeing. And mm -hmm. so, what I'm seeing THX do is push that forward. And I'd love to know more about where you see this going in the future for creators beyond just music. There's sound designers to keep in mind, right? Independent films yeah. and how that can mm -hmm. level up the experience. Even podcasting might get interesting in that way. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Where do you see this having the most impact or the most interesting types of impact? 
Well, I mean, you bring up podcasting and speech, and honestly, speech to me, anything that has speech in it is one of the best opportunities to add spatial audio. Um, I don't know, it, in some of your podcasts, right, if you put on headphones, it's like the person's right there in the in your ears, right? And it, it's sort of a weird effect to listen to podcasts on headphones. And when you add spatial audio to that, and so instead of the person is like talking right into your ears, it actually sounds there like they're, you know, a couple of feet in front of you. And maybe if there's a group podcast, you know, it almost sounds like they're in a circle around you or they're in front of you. It makes you feel like you're in the room with them, not that they're talking directly into your ears. And so um, that is one of the easiest ways to hear the benefit of spatial audio right away is for speech. So um, if you are doing an independent movie and you've had to ADR a lot of your dialogue and add it in later on, and you are you see the room and you see the person talking, but they added their dialogue later on, well, mostly those producers would have then started just to add a reverb and they would choose the reverb to try to simulate the room and feel. And so it was a lot of like guesswork about how to make you know them sound like they were in this room. Like if they're having a conversation in a concert hall, you know, they would just sort of throw a concert hall reverb. Whereas now with a spatial audio tool in your DAW, you just dial up the concert hall. There is a room, it's got the dimensions. You can change the ceiling and the floor and the walls and you can dial in how reflective the surfaces are. And then you add your uh, that effect onto that person talking and then place them in three-dimensional space where they are. So if they're walking around in the scene or they walk behind you and then they come back into the frame, you can you can automate that entire experience, and now it sounds like they're walking behind you. So, anything with speech, um, you know, podcasting and films and video games. Again, um, adding spatial audio makes it sound way more natural. Um, it's less fatiguing. I think when you listen to people talk in your ears, it's it's sort of very immediate sounding. And when it when you sort of put that person back into a room, which is how we normally hear people talking. It just sounds so much more natural. I think your brain operates at a little bit more of a lower level of, you know, cognitive awareness of that person. Um, so that's the speech side of things. But yeah, so, I mean, sound design, anything where you're doing sort of wild effects or you want a tool that can add something that nobody's ever heard before, um, spatial audio is a really good example of that. So I think sometimes people think like, oh, well, spatial audio is just sort of like to make it sound like I'm in the studio with the band or I'm on the stage with the band. And like, it's all about realism. And I'm constantly reminding people that sure, the tools can do hyper-realistic sounding, you know, acoustic um, rooms, but you can also use it as a wild effect, things flying around your head or moving around in front of you. And I talk a lot with my hands. So for anybody out there listening with only audio, I'm gesturingly, gesturing wildly. Um, oh. So I, you know, I'm always reminding people, uh, it's a cool effect to add effects. And so I sort of think back over the course of music technology as new tools emerge and people latched onto those and entirely new things you know, musically or creatively happened. I was thinking even before we were chatting about like some examples and auto-tune, I think was a great example, right? Yeah. That was a tool that was just invented to help people clean up vocals when their vocals weren't, you know, a little pitchy or or they liked the performance, but like this note was off. And then all of a sudden, some producers were like, no way, I'm putting that 100% <laughs> on everything. And like entire genres, you know, I think it's starting to go away a little bit now, but I start, I heard a song like just a week ago and it's like, oh my God, it's just layered in auto-tune. So, da you know, you never know. Funk, right? Oh, I know. Yeah. So, I mean, you never know how this tool might get misused, quote unquote, and turned into a cool new technique that people just are like, wow, I love that sound. 100%. I mean, I can think of any innovative musician from uh, Prince to, you know, James Brown probably would have found a use for that if he was still in the game early oh, on. Oh, yeah. yeah. I the just, Beatles. The, yeah, the, I mean, the Beatles just even started. Yeah. Right. I mean, they, all those artists who are really about experimentation and pushing these tools to do what they were maybe never intended to do or, or turned it all the way up when they should have just used it at like 5% and they got something wonderful out of it is... I always love that moment. Even the way uh, the Strokes developed their sound, right? Mm. Where with the distortion on the mic, 
Uh, yeah. Originally, it was kind of like a little too much, and then they tapered it back. I even see use cases for how the THX can bring moviegoers back to the theaters with these super immersive experiences that maybe you don't have at home anymore. Sure, you've yeah. got the big screen, but do you have the immersive audio experience? Well, especially in in new mediums like VR and mixed reality, where you're bringing the theater you know experience right to your living room. You know, normally that would be done on a TV and you would have to have a surround sound system and then you have to have speakers behind you and there's cables all over the place and it's, you know, it's it's not great. And so, you know, with VR headsets and spatial audio there, um, you're really getting that virtual surround experience that, you know, it, I mean, your seat isn't rumbling like you would get <laughs> in a movie theater. But honestly, movie theaters have gotten so incredibly loud. Um, uh, you know, I like the fact where, on these devices, you have the user has more control, which means if they want to turn the dialogue up, they can turn the dialogue up. I mean, the only time I enjoyed watching Tenet was when I watched on headphones and I could turn the dialogue up because I could not, you know, people complained at length yeah. about dialogue <laughs> in movies not being loud enough. And and uh, it's another place where spatial audio helps with that because it just makes you feel like you're in a more natural space. I mean, my head is buzzing with the possibilities of what the future may hold for entertainment experiences, leveraging technologies like THX, Spatial Creator Tool, and what that affords creators to be able to give to people who want to experience right, new right. things, interesting things. Like you said, hyper-realism is possible, but also the possibilities are infinite. And that's what makes it so exciting. So with that said, I'd love to roll out the red carpet and let you tell people what else you're working on, what they should know about what's available now, how they can maybe get the tool itself and all Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Right, yeah. So the best way is to just head over to THX.com. So if you go to THX.com backslash THX Spatial Creator, sort of a lot of letters, but immediately there's a bunch of information there. There's videos there if you want to hear the plugin being used. There's a link right there. Uh, that takes you to Plugin Alliance. So we partnered with the great folks at Plugin Alliance um, who are under the Native Instruments brand, and they've got an amazing marketplace of plugins. So traditionally, it's a lot of EQs and compressors, um, but we've added our THX Spatial Creator plugin there. You can try it out for free. There's like a 14-day free trial. Try it out. Uh, and in fact, there is a sale going on right now. So, so anybody jumping on the podcast right now can take advantage of a sale. But it's over there at Plugin Alliance, um, and it's also part of their bundle. So that's the one of the new things with um, plugins these days. Is instead of buying them a la carte, you can get into a bundle and try out lots of different plugins um, for a, a monthly fee rather than just buying the plugin. So there's a couple different ways. So that's what I've been working on, um, and we're always looking for ways to improve it. So if you try out the plugin and and have some feedback about something that you want to hear or have it do, let us know. Um, and or let the folks at Plugin Alliance know. And so, and then the future uh, for us is a number of different things. We're very interested, in, of course, in, in hearing spatial audio get better for earbuds. And so that's where we're spending a lot of time. Um, a lot of spatial audio has been really focused on gamers and gaming headsets. So like if you, um, you know, uh, have a Razer headsets and you're playing video games with that, you're getting spatial audio through your PC. But our focus is being, now that we sort of like uh, figured out all the tech for that domain, getting that kind of spatial audio experience over into earbuds, uh, I think is the key. And especially that's where uh, cool new technology like head tracking, right? So if you move your head around, the spatial audio stays locked in the world, even though you're moving your head around. That makes the whole technology sound more realistic. And so really excited and seeing advances of embedded chips that can run in the you know in your little earbuds and how powerful they're getting because now we can actually run uh very high quality algorithms on those tiny little earbuds and um you know and and in tandem with other things like you know noise cancellation and suppression and all those other audio technologies so i think we're really interested in in the domain of making sure that people get good spatial audio experiences on headphones as well I mean, I can just hear the passion when you talk about this technology, and it's no surprise to me how you ended up where you are today. Uh, <laughs> they say, very they lucky. Say that, yeah, they say everything is going to be hard no matter what you choose, and that's why you have to choose something that you actually enjoy oh, yeah. and are passionate about, because it, there will be times where you can't even believe this is happening and what's going to happen next, or what are you going to do? And then you remember why you fell in love with yep. this entire idea and what you're working on and how that's going to impact the world, and you can create things like this. 
So I can't thank you enough, Kasson, for being able to stop by, break it down, give us some samples, and uh, invite us to try it out for 14 days and yeah. bundle right it up with other things. It's just, it's just, it's too good to pass up. So thank you for, especially someone like in the podcasting space like myself. Now I mm. want to check it out. What is that going to do? What can I create yeah. with this? The wheels are turning, and it's all yeah. thanks to you. Good to hear. Good to hear. Well, thank you for having me, Philip. Great to chat.